coming up for our fourth anniversary here at Barnsdale, and the garden's now beginning to get established. It's a nice stage, I think, because everything is beginning now to grow up so that you can't see the whole of the garden all at once. But of course, inevitably, that means that there are areas here and there that aren't beginning to get overcrowded. So I'm going round now with my notebook, just jotting down things that have got to be moved this autumn. I don't like to see too much bare soil in my borders, so what I did here was to plant hardy herbaceous plants fairly close to shrubs just to fill up the space while the shrubs were growing. But of course, as soon as they start to impede the growth of the shrubs and to spoil their shape, then something's got to give. And there's a perfect example here. These Michaelmas daisies are now growing into this cotinus and that will eventually spoil the shape. So the Michaelmas daisies are the ones that have got to go because herbaceous plants actually thrive on being moved whereas shrubs do like to get their feet under the table and keep them there. So I shall make a note of those Michaelmas daisies and move them in the spring because that's when they like to be shifted. But there are plenty of others that like to be moved now so earlier on I went round with John Kelly and together we've decided which ones need to be shifted and he's volunteered to give me a hand lifting them and also splitting them to provide lots more new plants. Though I've got a funny feeling he had an ulterior motive volunteering for that job so I've also been pointing out to him some of my more notable planting mistakes so he's going to have quite a bit of digging to do today. Well, I've also filled up some spaces with half-hardy annuals. They give quite a zest to the border during the summer, but of course now they're beginning to go over, and certainly as soon as the first frost comes along, they're going to be clobbered. So Anne Swithenbank's going to give me a hand there, pulling those out and replacing them with the hardy spring bedding, which will give me a good show early on in the year. Well, this is the last programme in this series and we won't be back with you until the first week in January but of course there's still plenty to be getting on with during the autumn and the winter. I'm going to be kicking off the autumn planting because I still believe, containers or no containers, that autumn is the best time for planting certainly trees and shrubs. But looking back on this last season, it's certainly been a funny one, hasn't it? It started off really promising and then all of a sudden it turned wet and cold and it never really recovered. Mind you, it's been a good year, I think, for growth in the ornamental borders, but in the vegetable garden, my goodness, there have been some problems. How about this for unmitigated disaster? These are all onions that have been raised from sets and almost every one of them has run to seed. And if my post bag is anything to go by, then there are gardeners all over the country having exactly the same problem. And I put it mainly down to the weather. The trouble is that if onion sets have a cold spell after planting, they tend to run to seed. And it doesn't need to be that cold either, only about 43 degrees Fahrenheit. So what can we do about it? Well, the first thing you can do is to choose the right variety. The Stuttgarter and Sturon varieties are less prone than the Rheinsberger varieties. But more important than that is to choose the right size of set. Now, if you look at an onion set like that, it looks wonderful, doesn't it? And you go into a shop and you'd be very tempted to buy that. It will certainly give you a bigger yield too. Uh, much bigger bulbs and therefore a bigger overall yield. The trouble is that sets of that size are much more prone to bolting than sets of that size and that's the one you ought to go for. I can tell you that the commercial growers always go for those because they don't want to risk these big ones bolting even if they're going to get a bigger crop from them. There are some seedsmen who are offering heat treated sets and research has shown that heat treated sets are certainly less prone to bolting. Having said that, this row here is Showmaster. They were heat treated and there are quite a few there that have run to seed this year. Not as many as the others I must admit. Now, I think that the other important thing is to try and avoid that cold period. Now, of course, we can't change the weather. But one of the things that books often recommend is planting onion sets, say, in February. I think that's much too early, and the end of March is perfectly okay. If you want to get an early start, start them off in the greenhouse, in, in pots or proper packs, or alternatively, do what we've recommended for a long time, and that is cover the area 
that you're going to plant them in with a bit of polythene to warm the soil up. About the end of March, take the polythene off, put your onion sets out, and then cover them up with a bit of this woven polypropylene material to keep them warm until the weather warms up a little bit. And that way you could well avoid it. Mind you, I haven't done that badly with onions this year. I'm quite pleased with this crop here. These are uh, seed rays. They were sown in the greenhouse in February. This is a variety called Hygro. And they were multiple sown. That is sowing six or eight seeds in a block and planting them out in a little clump without thinning. And you can see now that they just jostle each other out of the way and produce perfectly good-sized, kitchen-sized bulbs. Good way of growing them, that. But not quite as good as my very best onion here. How about that one for size? I'm quite proud of that. Well, no, I'm joking, I must admit. Uh, this one was grown actually by a chap called Ivan Mace in the Rhonda Valley, and it is a world record breaker. It's just won him £2,000 in the Kelsey Onion Festival. This is a variety called the Kelsey, and in doing so, it smashed the world record. Previously, it was, what, £7, 11 and 3 quarter ounces. This one weighs a magnificent £8, 13 and a half ounces. Not bad, eh? Jeff sent me down here to sort out what he says are mistakes. Well, Jeff doesn't make a lot of mistakes. This isn't one, really. This is a Far Eastern member of the daisy family. It's not a bad plant at all. It has nice feathery yellow flowers. They've gone over now, but they decorate the later part of the summer. It's okay. The only thing is it does spread quite rampantly. Now, with some plants, that's a disaster. But with this one, there's no reason why you shouldn't grow the plant, because if it does get a bit above itself, you just pull bits out and just get rid of them and leave what you want. Now, there's only one thing. By pulling that out, I've exposed this rose to the wind. And if the wind gets hold of this, and actually the winds here are pretty strong, what's going to happen is that this movement will be translated right down to just above soil level. Where the plant joins the soil, there will be also a certain amount of circular motion and what's going to happen is that you'll get a hole at the bottom of the rose which will fill up with water and that's the last thing you want well the answer to that is to reduce some of this sail area and make the wind have less effect so you can cut it back by at least a third and make a sloping cut but there's no need to be very accurate about outward pointing buds and that sort of thing at this stage because we are going to have some frosts and you'll probably get a little bit of dieback, uh, but you've pruned at a point above which you'd normally prune. So next March, you can go in and do the job accurately and properly. Just now, that's going to... And I think I might as well take a bit off there, because there's also quite a lot of movement. Now, that really isn't going to shift very much. It might be a good idea, just at this stage as well, just to firm the soil around the base of the rows, just to give it a good anchorage. I said that that wasn't really a mistake, but I'm afraid this is. This actually is a good plant as well, but it's a plant in the wrong place. This is Rubus tricolor. Now, if you've got a big garden and you've got an area of dry shade under trees, it's always a problem. This is a plant which will solve it. It'll grow absolutely anywhere. Nice glossy leaves and flowers about, oh, I suppose an inch and a half across, white, and also red berries. But here, it's a little bit of a disaster. It's invaded this conifer, it's invading the phloxes, and there's only one thing to do, and Jeff agrees with me. All we've got to do is just get on with it and start pulling it out. We've been lucky here at Barnsdale because we haven't had any frost yet, but I'm sure we will soon, so all these summer flowering bulbs will have to come inside for the winter, be stored in a frost-free place. The eucomas here are quite tender, they've done very well, but unless you've got a very sheltered border, they will need some frost protection. So I'd lift those, pop them up into some potting compost, give them one water, and then just let them dry out for the rest of the winter. They can be put back outside the following spring. And with these gladioli, once they've started going brown and yellow, you can dig them up out of the ground and store them. 
There's the tuber. Leave them separate for about a week, just so that they can dry out a little bit, and then store them either in string bags or boxes in a frost-free place. And a little later on, when they've dried out, you can take off the old tuber on the bottom. You see that? You can see the new tuber and the old one. The old one will pull off when it's dry, and you can also take off any of the papery bits on the outside and store those. I'm afraid they're not always guaranteed to flower again the following year, so if you want gladioli for a very important patch of the garden, I'd buy some new ones and put the old ones out in the allotment for cut flower or something. With dahlias, it's important to let them get blackened by the frost and leave them for about a week before you lift them. The reason for this is because towards the end of the season, during the short days, the tubers do a lot of building up for the following year. So it's quite important not to lift them yet, but to wait until the frost has caught them. And then, when you have got them out, if they've got some stems still on them, you should leave them upside down for about a week and just let the sap run out of the stem so it doesn't rot the tuber. And then they can be put into boxes with some compost just covering the roots, not right over the crown, just some peat or some old dryish compost and just stored like that for the rest of the winter in a frost-free place. Perhaps just check them once or twice to make sure they're not going mouldy. Now, we've taken out the bedding plants from this bed because although they haven't completely finished flowering, they were as good as finished. And we want to get the spring bedding in. And if you've got time to do it, you really want to get cracking. And although Jeff grows all his own stuff at Barnsdale, we thought it'd be quite useful to go out and see what the local garden centres had to offer. It has some nice Canterbury bells, which they were selling at 30p for a pot. And they're quite tall plants. They grow between one and two feet tall. And they spread quite a lot as well. So you want to give them about a foot apart so they can develop properly. Put them towards the middle or back of the border as they're quite tall. And I want to put some forget-me-nots, some myosotis around the front here. These were selling at £2 for 24 plants. Now, I like to put some tulips in between the myosotis. These are golden apple doon, and I think the blue and the gold will look very well together. They want to go, I suppose, about six inches apart. Plant the plants in, and then just put the tulips in amongst them. And the tulips, of course, want to be planted about six inches deep, and just space them out so there's a nice clump of them there. Universal pansies are very reliable. These are 30p locally, but I think you might find they're a little bit more expensive, especially in towns. Uh, you might find them even going up to about 60p. But of course, the nice thing about these is that that's a bit of a moth-eared one. The nice thing about them is that in the winter, if you get some mild patches, their beautiful flowers will come out. You've got a few mild days in amongst all the freezing cold ones. So they're good for the winter as well as the spring. These are just own wallflowers which are very very good just look at the roots on those they're superb plants i can't guarantee you're going to find these everywhere you go the local garden center was able to offer them fresh out of the ground which is quite unusual so be careful what sort of quality you buy these were about 50p for a dozen and if you do have a nice little local garden center that will dig them fresh then i'd go and make friends with them as soon as you can the other thing about planting spring bedding is make sure you put it where you can see it from the house. Go inside and think, if I'm in the kitchen or the dining room, where do I want to see my splash of colour? And then you'll get the most out of it. If you're planting bare-rooted trees, it's absolutely essential to keep these roots out of the wind, out of the sun, to prevent them drying out. So, if you can't plant them straight away, then just cover them up with soil like that, and they'll be fine until you can. It's a good time of the year to be planting now. Did you know that between 35% and 50% of container-grown trees, like this one, which are planted in the spring, will die in their first year? In the drought year of 1976, that figure rose to 90%, which rather indicates that there's nothing wrong with a container-grown tree. It's the lack of aftercare afterwards that is going to kill them. Now, the advantage with planting in the autumn is, first of all, that you're not going to come across that dry spell because during the winter the soil is going to be quite moist. Secondly, most of the trees will have lost their leaves, so they're not going to lose so much water. 
Even the evergreens are going to benefit from the lower temperatures. That means they won't lose a lot of water too. The other thing is that the soil has been warmed by the summer sun. And also, nature gives you a bonus too, because recent research has shown that as soon as a plant loses its leaves, there's a surge of root activity. And that means that if you plant in the autumn, a plant is going to get established, rooted in before the worst of the winter, ready for a tear-away start in the spring. But there's one other great advantage. You just compare these two trees. They're both the same variety. They were both bought in the same nursery on the same day. But just look at those two. Just compare those two stems there. This one is much better. Now, the difference is that this one is field-grown. It does mean that you can only plant that one in the autumn. But what a much better tree it is. Secondly, the container-grown tree is going to cost you £14, whereas the field-grown tree will only cost £8.60. So you're getting a better plant at a cheaper price. Now, when you plant it, it pays to prepare the ground well. If you just dig a hole in uncultivated soil, even if you break up the bottom, the hole is going to fill with water, particularly on heavy soil, and the tree won't like that. So I've cultivated the whole of this border, and I've worked in some of my own compost in here, and that's really nice stuff, and that's going to give the tree a really good start in life. If you haven't got compost, of course, you can use peat. I also like to just improve the soil that I've dug out as well, just to add a little bonus and a little bit round the edges too, and I'll show you why in a second. Just like that. And then a little bit of bone meal, handful is all you need, and that will get the roots going really well. Now, if you're planting any tree, you must make sure, bare rooted or container grown, that you don't put it in too deeply. Those roots there want to be just below soil level. So, get your spade, stick it across the hole like that, and that's absolutely perfect. Don't get them in too deep. Having done that, you can just work a little bit of soil in from the side. I like to do it this way because then you know you're getting the best of the topsoil. Right, so when you've done that, just grab the tree and shake it up and down a bit. And that'll work soil in between the roots, so you've got no air spaces. You can then start refilling. A little firm halfway through. Don't absolutely pound it down, particularly if you're on heavy soil. And then you can completely refill the hole. Now, you'll notice that I put the stake in the hole first, before planting. That obviously avoids damage to the roots. And notice, too, that it's a very short stake. The reason for that is that research has shown that if the tree is allowed to wave around in the breeze, then the stem will actually thicken up at the bottom and the root system will be better. So, just use a... a a stake that comes about a third of the way up and also use a proper plastic tree tie. Never wire, never nylon string because if you do it'll cut into the bark and kill the tree. Now get it on like that. You'll notice that there's a little collar here which stops it actually rubbing against the stake and then when you've done that, you know, in windy weather, that's, that um, tie will slip down the stake. So just hold it on with a little tack like that. That's all it needs. And that will grow away really well. Now, if you're planting a container-grown tree, almost the same, but just a few differences. First of all, of course, always take the pot off. It's not going to grow out of that. Secondly, there's no need to shake it up and down because the compost is already round the roots, of course. And thirdly, and this is really very important, you don't want to stick the stake straight through the root ball like that. That is absolutely wrong. It's going to damage the root ball. So plant your tree first, 
then put your stake in at an angle and tie it to that and with this lovely warm soil and moist weather these trees are going to get away to a really good start you definitely have to change the way you care about houseplants between the summer and winter especially with light because not only are the days shorter but the quality of light is not so good as well which means that the growth the plants make is, a, is going to be of less good quality and window sills are a potential hazard area because when you draw the curtains at night and it's frosty outside obviously it's making a very cold pocket for the plants that are in there especially if it's drafty as well so my advice would be not to grow any tropical plants at all on the window sill and choose plants which can tolerate fairly low temperatures anyway if you can remember bring them inside when it's very frosty outside so that they're not there at all during the night but if you can't remember stick to this type of plant and the lower the temperatures the less water you want to give them. That's why it's quite a good idea to grow succulents on the windowsill. They like good light anyway, and you can let them get this dry between waterings, and they'll last a lot better under those conditions. Another hazard area in the room, really, is hot, dry air. Now, I wouldn't put these foliage house plants this close to a radiator if it was on, and either not use it or move them further away into the room. But they are going to suffer if the air is dry. And one way of getting around it is to group them together because they'll all benefit each other. They'll all give off moisture. Moisture will rise from the pots and that creates a sort of environment around them which has a softening effect. Now if you haven't got the space to do that, you can put several plants together in a planter. And you might think I'm getting myself into trouble because I've used something with no drainage hole. But if you put plenty of drainage matter in the bottom, pebbles or expanded clay like this on the surface, then that makes a reservoir for the water to sink down into. And providing you don't put pints and pints on, you'll find that the water won't sit in the soil too much. And all these plants, especially ferns with their delicate fronds, which hate dry air, will benefit by being grown together in that way. Now another method is to use a gravel tray where the plants aren't actually sitting in water, but the water is under them and around them, and evaporating constantly around the plant. Now this got a rather hard deal last year and suffered from hot dry air and you can see how the tips have got really brown and dry and also dry conditions encourage red spider mites on the same leaf I think we can see all the speckling damage that was made last year I managed to get rid of the mites but if you can keep the air humid around the plant it definitely discourages them and the whole plant will be much healthier now not only do you want to try and keep the watering a little bit lower in winter, but you don't want to feed too much either, because the more nitrogen you give the plants, the more growth they'll try and make. And if they're not getting the light, that growth will be poor. But they do want to make some growth. You can see these new leaves coming along on this Aspidistra. So a little bit of food is a good idea. If you think they do need feeding, use slow-release fertiliser. Now these come either in sticks or granules or pellets, and you can just push them down into the compost you find the right spot and they will gradually release nutrients as the plant wants it over a period of two months or more during the winter and you don't have to worry about it anymore this year on Gardener's World looking really good this is variegated ground elder and it's been on the market a little while but I think it's beginning to show itself in its true colours it's got into this lamb's ears, this stachys, and I think we must get it out. And it's going to be a matter of disentangling the roots of the ground elder from the roots of the lamb's ears. And then, while we're at it, we'll divide the plant. Well, there we are. There's some nice little divisions at the side of the plant. And I'm going to take a clump of these away with me and find somewhere else to put them. This is one of my favourite plants. This is a small tree or large shrub. It's a dogwood. It's called Cornus controversa variegata. It's a very beautiful plant, but it's very expensive as well. Well, as it's such a precious thing, I thought it'd be quite a nice idea to make the most of it. And that's why I thought that the stachys, with its grey foliage, would look really nice against the variegated foliage of the tree. 
that's just the sort of division you want. Nice roots and a good firm crown. Now these want to be planted about two foot six apart because they will make quite solid substantial carpets in time and although planting these little divisions doesn't give a great deal of effect just now wait a year or two and the results are going to be very nice indeed now with a plant like the cornice in a windy garden like this and the wind comes this way it's worth spending a few bob on protecting them especially from the icy winds during the winter and I've brought this netting along now a roll of this which is agricultural windbreak netting will set you back a few quid but you can use it year after year after year and it does break the wind especially those frost laden winds which damage plants so severely and for the sake of doing this it's just worth the extra time of trouble of knocking a few staples in and doing the job properly. Here's a noble vegetable for you. This is a cardoon, much revered by the Victorians and a real delicacy. It's the blanched hearts that you eat, so at this time of the year you take these tough outside leaves and tie them up to keep that heart nice and soft and tender and they'll be ready in about five or six weeks time. The plants themselves are not hardy so they need protecting from frost. So what I do is cut the bottom off an old potato sack, slip it over the plant, stuff it full of straw and that keeps it fine and free from frost. Well. I've been getting on already with my winter digging. As soon as you've got a bit of space spare, then get on with it. Don't forget to work your manure not only in the bottom of the trench, but through all the levels too, and I put a little bit on the top as well. I'm going to grow some early potatoes here, but the trouble with my very heavy soil is that it's very hard to work in the spring. So it occurred to me, why not cut the trenches now, when it's nice and easy to work, and then it'll be much easier in the spring. Well, we'll be back with you in the first week in January. One of the things that we'll be doing, of course, is our definitive slug trial. We're determined to win. So, if you've grown a slug-infested cabbage like this, you need us, so don't miss it.